Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, joined once more by Reese for another entry in the David Fincher retrospective. And this week, we have reached the social network, released in 2010 with a screenplay written by Aaron Sorkin. First of all, Reese, how are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. In high spirits. Um, very high spirits, actually. One of the reasons is because of the top I'm wearing. Don't want to get into football talk too much, but positivity on the football front um, and ready for London Film Festival, mate. So um, very much on the, on the positive side at the moment, for sure. Absolutely. And people at home, we are pre-recording this. It is the night before the London Film Festival at the time of recording. God knows where Chelsea could be in two weeks' time when this video comes up. At the same time, they could be in a great place in two weeks. So pre-recording, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because everything goes out of date. By the time this episode goes up, the London Film Festival would have been and gone. And you may notice we are missing Tate tonight. He bailed us out last week with Benjamin Button. We're pre-recording a lot of videos uh, in the lead-up to the film festival because it's a very, very busy few weeks. Hopefully the uploads reflect that. Um, again, predicting from the future. Um, I was quite ill. I'm still not 100% of the time recording. So I miss Benjamin Button, a film I had never seen that I very much enjoyed um, that I'd put off for reasons I don't know. So I was actually a bit gutted to miss that. And in turn... Uh, Tate was with us on the stream but as he's currently somewhere new location wise we're not able to get him in for recording so he's missed his he's spent weeks on this series digging up the social network every week saying he can't wait to get to it we've been able to get a time in before the festival we've been able to get it we started earlier to get this in recording and uh, he has had to unfortunately miss out so we will get his thoughts on Dragon Tattoo very briefly about Social Network as well. Um, but that's why he's not here. Um, so a bit gutted, but it does happen. Um, thankfully, we're pre-recording, we're not live. Um, but before we sort of get into stuff, Reese, it's the first time we've had you on for this retrospective. I know you're a Fincher fan. I know you spoke about it before. And as soon as I messaged you about this, you, you put the Social Network. So I knew I'd get you on for this one straight away. So thank you for that. But I just want to ask, can you remember maybe the first Fincher film you saw, everyone gives different stories and backgrounds, but I'm very curious about this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'm very bad with kind of when it comes to my history of watching films and what I've seen first. It's like when that question comes up on Twitter, what's the first film you remember seeing or the first film you remember seeing in a cinema? As someone who watches hundreds on hundreds of films every year and have been for the last 20 years of my life, um, it's very hard to remember. I think if I had to give a guess, it would probably be Panic Room. I think that was probably the one which I seen first. Um, or Fight Club. I, I oof. Probably Panic Room, I think, but potentially Fight Club. I think they're the two would probably be the most obvious answers just for timings and stuff. Okay. Yeah, That's interesting. Probably one of those two, but I'm not 100% sure on that. So... It's so if we, you saw Jared Leto get battered uh, one way or the other for the first time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw Jared Leto get battered. Exactly, 100%. Um, that's pretty great. It, it is interesting. This, and I do think since doing this series, you know, I've always been a fan of David Fincher. I think most people into film, as like an overall, I've, I've come across very few, if any, who have been like, I hate David Fincher's films. I don't like his films. And they're so varied across his career that I always feel there's some that jump towards different people and kind of getting ready to get into this one today. The Social Network came out in 2010. I saw this, we picked it up on DVD, like probably before the Oscars, right? You know, when like sometimes films, it's either pre or post Oscars, the DVD comes out ready for the ceremony. And I remember watching this, uh, just giving my notes before we get into it properly. And I, I didn't care for it. But I was 13 years old, I like to say. Um, and a 13-year-old who has Facebook, who goes and watches a Facebook film, isn't going to... I'm not saying this film's smart. I'm not going to understand the courtroom politics and everything else about it. I'm not going to understand the craft that much. So that's why I was 14, I should realise. Um, I've quite been quite excited, ready for a rewatch, because it really, I, not that I don't remember much. The main thing I remember is the... Um, the, the Andrew Garfield clip that's everywhere, isn't it? Or is you better lawyer up? Um, and I've been waiting to rewatch this, and this series was the excuse to do it. Of course, the killer releases 
in just under a month by the time this video goes up that's going to be at the festival we might have some coverage of it we hope we've got a bit more than normal but that will be done as it's done at the festival but um what i want to ask you reese very briefly just your background with the social network i know you, you wanted to be on this one so for myself and anyone else i might be curious as to not not why this one but just you know do you remember seeing it at the time it came out like just your history with that i guess yeah, this was a, a, by far the the most interesting film that I wanted to talk about because there's just so much that I love about this film. I just honestly feel like it's a perfect film. Everything just kind of correlates together in such a way which I don't see that often. It just everything about it for me was was perfect. Um, I know that obviously with Fincher, he's a, a man who does loads of takes right to get everything the way he wants it obviously very stanley kubrickish personally i understand that and this film i think is the accumulation of all of them takes um coming to fruition at the end for what is the social network i love this film it's one of my all-time favorite films it's in my top 10 all time it's easily my favourite Fincher film. And he's got some brilliant films in his filmography. Of course, you've spoken about a few of them already and we'll speak about a few more in the, in the coming weeks. But, man, the social network is just brilliant. I remember being head over heels about the film when I first seen it. I wasn't fully aware of the ins and outs of Facebook as a website and the shenanigans that happen behind closed doors the uh, Edward Chavarin stuff I wasn't aware of, the Napster deals and everything I wasn't aware of. I really didn't know too much about the whole Facebook situation. Obviously, I knew it was ran by Mark Zuckerberg, but like him as a person, him going to Harvard and the ins and outs of making the website and the stuff with the Winklevoss twins, didn't know any of that existed. And I felt like, for a story about the making of Facebook, it is extremely interesting. And I still don't know if the way they kind of portrayed Zuckerberg is right. I don't know if I've seen enough from him in the public eye to make me think that he was as manipulative and kind of, I don't know, structured the downfall of his best mate like he did in the film. I do feel like there are certain parts of the film which I do feel are very much in line with who I think he is as a person. But I also do feel like um, a little bit of his obviously a bit kind of made for film. But as a film, I loved it the first time I saw it. And every single time I've seen it since, I still feel the same way. If anything, my infatuation with the film grows upon viewings that's really interesting I, i'm kind of in a, in a similar vein as, as well with that that again it's been 12 or 13 years clearly since i've watched this so not a lot has changed in my own life social media not just facebook has changed somewhat significantly and a film like this i think is far more interesting maybe not now but as a concept i think i'm probably more the right age and understanding of social media and like not it but you know i mean that sort of behind the scenes stuff it, it's a lot more it's quite scary how not new the film was. I'm trying to think of the right term that uh, if you want to get contextual this week, there's reports of the, uh, the imploding Titanic submarine things going to probably get a film, whether that's true or not, we still don't know, but we're in this age where films get announced straight away. I know there was 9 like 11 films within years. Uh, there was the Boston marathon bombing had a film pretty quick turnaround. It seems to be part and parcel now. Um, one thing Tropic Thunder nailed on the head was you know, how ridiculous those sorts of things get. And for a Facebook film to come out in 2010, when it was created in 04, and there's some interesting behind the scenes we'll talk about, I'll talk about later on, but what sort of hit me on this second viewing is how, how well across, it doesn't feel like some rushed cash grab, let's quickly make a Facebook film because Facebook's popular. It's not that at all. And, and we'll dive into some of that behind the scenes, which will probably explain why it isn't that. Big reason, obviously, David Fincher, and another big reason, Aaron Sorkin. Um, but before we get into that behind the scenes, we'll, we'll do the IMDb plot synopsis, which is a mouthful, as we always do on these. But um, here we go. As Harvard student Mark Zuckerberg creates the social networking site that would become known as Facebook, 
He is sued by the twins who claimed he stole their idea and by the co-founder who was later squeezed out of the business. Exactly the story of the film. Great. Nails a synopsis on that front. But I knew nothing about the behind the scenes of this film. Uh, I still, I'm the same as you, right? You watch this film, you think, is Mark Zuckerberg like a piece of shit like that? Yes, we know he's a, a very, well, he's one of the wealthiest people on the planet. We know there's obviously a lot of stories out there about him. And you always wonder, irreflective of this film, any film that's a biopic of sorts or depicts real people, it's always a representation of, of how they're coming across within story. There is a lot of behind the scenes to this film um, of in terms of the actual real life side of the Facebook people that were not involved. None of them were involved. Um, and what we'll kind of get into to begin with, which I, I think sets the story in motion is, Aaron Sorkin was involved with this film before Fincher, before anybody else. And that was something I was very curious about. With the turnaround of Zodiac 07, Benjamin Button 08, this in 2010, that's three films in essentially three years for a director. I'm always curious about the time skills, right? Every director's got different methods. Nolan, one film at a time, never anything more. Gaps in between. He picks his film, he does it. Spielberg, can juggle two, two, three films at the same time, can have 10 films that he's meant to be working on down the line and he'll do maybe two of them. I'm always intrigued about the behind the scenes of the films such as this. But what I really didn't expect was, and I didn't even know this is a book, a book was released called The Accidental Billionaires. This screenplay was picked up by Aaron, well, it was picked up by Aaron Sorkin before it had ever been published. Um, so he was involved from the get-go. And the reports say that he said that as time's gone by, 80% of the screenplay was done by the time this book actually ended up releasing. So to me, what that shows, and I think you know, if you look at Aaron Sorkin's career and his writing and what he's done, the screenplay we'll talk about, of course, he wins the Oscar for this as well. It's not the idea of Facebook that attracted him to the project. And I would also argue, ironically, it's been very hard to find David Fincher quotes about getting into this production compared to Zodiac where there was so much Benjamin Button there's others but for this there's not much in respect to timelines of Fincher coming on board but it really feels like Aaron Sorkin sort of got the, got the car running and then David Fincher sort of puts foot down with it and I think that explains that 2010 release which is again normally for me a concern with films that are so quick after real life events but at the same time it it, it works as favor some what I kind of want to ask you is very quickly before you do a little bit more on the behind the scenes, what are your thoughts on, on the screenplay with respect to that? This is one that a lot of people talk about as one of the best screenplays as one of their favorite films for however many last years it's been released. I was astounded how good that screenplay was. And that's full credit to the directors, to the cast as well for taking it on board. You can have a great screenplay, but if you have poor performers, a poor director, it can really badly affect it. In respect, you can have a great screen, you can have a poor screenplay, and actors can bring gravitas to it. But this film, and I hate using the word perfect, we know David Finch is a perfectionist. There is something about this film where every single cylinder fires and every single one hits. I can't even look at something saying, hmm, this doesn't work for me in the context of the film, what we watch. Yeah. No, I, I massively agree with you in relation to the, the, the perfect nature of this film. It's kind of wild it's kind of wild how the, the film is it's it, you need to think every single minute decision when making a film has an effect on the, the film as a whole and this is not just minute details in relation to the script this is the acting performances the direction let's take let's do one more take maybe that take that they end up doing is the one they end up using in the film so the film could be completely different just from one take. The score from one sound effect could completely change the, the feel of the film. There's so many different things that come together to make a film. And I do feel like the script is always the first. But on this, it's most certainly the first component that had to go into this perfection of a film, right? Yeah. You said, why did Fincher get involved? The, the script is probably why he got involved and why every single actor got involved because I've read the script after watching the film and it's just, it is so on point. The, the words just flow so easily off that page. It's just so dynamic. And 
I think the biggest tell for the script and the biggest is the opening scene with Rooney Mara and, um, yeah. and Jesse Eisenberg when they're in that bar. That scene is just so quick, so fast-witted, so fast-paced. It gives such a great idea of the characters immediately and just the way it sets up the whole film, that one scene and the conversation that they have is pretty incredible. I can't remember who it was. Somebody said that they disliked the script a couple of months back and I was disgusted, <laughs> to be honest. I was like, there's certain things I can understand, people not liking films because it may not be to their yeah. taste. But you, I don't know how you could watch this film and think that this script is not one of the best scripts to ever grace a, a movie. It's just so, so good. Um, yeah, Sorkin's best work for me and one of my all-time favourite scripts. I'd probably put it up there with Casablanca and yeah, I, I think they're probably my two favourite scripts. And Persona. So Persona, Casablanca and this are probably my three favourite scripts. And they're three of my all-time favourite films so that kind of says a lot about what I think about the screenwriting here. It's really interesting we're talking screenplays. We don't normally do it this early in a film but with Sorkin at the helm Strangely enough, the only film he's done with Fincher, no TV works together either. I'd love to see them do something down the line. I know that Aaron Sorkin said he'd want to do a second social network film. Um, normally I laugh at that, but if they want to go the aliens route, we could call it the social networks. It can be this, quote, cage fight that's going to happen between Zuckerberg and Musk, I don't know. Um, apparently Jesse Eisenberg would happily play the role again. Um strange that there is a film called The Social Network and in which they talk, they talk about sequels. Obviously, there's not been one. But Sorkin said he'll do it if Fincher ever wanted to do it. Me, personally, I know it's jumping to the end of the video, so I don't want a second one. But um, if, if there was a script to any level like this and a story to be told, I'd be so curious about that just as a concept. Like, could they do this? Not again, but is there a story to tell? Because I would like to see them work with each other more. I know that Fincher takes his projects film to film. Um, and again, for this one, we can't quite get the origins of him jumping on board, but I think you nailed it, that there's no way a director such as Fincher reads this script. And Fincher, who's a, who has written as well, isn't looking at saying, like, it reminds me of, you know, when certain directors come out, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, Denny, Den, Denny uh, Villeneuve spoke recently, right? When he got linked to Bond, he sort of declined it politely. And then he said, if I didn't do Dune, if I didn't take it now, I'm not ever going to do yeah. it. That's it. That's done. And what was interesting with this script, this script was on, is it the blacklist? That infamous, here's all the scripts that have been done that haven't been picked up. There's many and times this... with scripts and stuff. And it's it, you don't know how many times scripts get floated around the industry before yeah. the films get made. And the amount of times when I was acting back in the day that I would have people that I would be aware of and say, look, this film, you need to be getting an audition for this film. You need to be speaking to your agent about this film because when this film gets made, it's going to be really, really good. And most of the time, 95% of the time, they were right. Like, Attack the Block came out and I was like, I was told before that film came out, get into the casting for Attack the Block. Because Joe Cornish has written an absolutely unbelievable film. And the social network script is one of those ones that people must have been reading that and foaming at the mouth and be like, get me involved with this film. The casting process must have been extremely easy. It's like a Tarantino film, right? I think Tarantino comes calling, every single person will be in his film, whether it's for one scene or it's the whole the whole thing. Like Leo, I think Leonardo DiCaprio, knowing how big he is as an actor, would probably turn up to a Tarantino film for a couple of lines. Yeah. It, it goes the same with, with this script. I think the script is just, again, perfect is such a crazy word to use when talking about media, any type of media, films, music, whatever it may be, because everyone has their different definitions of perfect and different ideas of the film. But the script is 100% perfect. Yeah, I, I am with you on that. And I do think with the scripts, bringing Fincher on board, you mentioned some of the cast, we'll, we'll get into those shortly as well. But if we if we talk some the direction of this, so there's so much more because we, we, will, we will talk about the screenplay a lot more because I think one thing that is worth bringing up as well is that Aaron Talk didn't only say that, you know, he, he wasn't attached to it because of the idea of Facebook. It was the book itself. Um, I don't know if you might have heard of the book. I think the four names called The Accidental Billionaires, 
The Founding of Facebook, A Tale of Sex, Money, Genius, and Betrayal, written by Bez Mezrich. Um, now, Eduardo Sabrin was involved with that book, but he was not involved at all with the film. Uh, and what was really interesting if you sort of move into the direction is David Fincher banned the entire cast from interacting with the real-life counterparts, from getting in contact with them. He wanted their approach to be, as I guess, not as original as it can be, but also when it's David Fincher, it's his film, it's his way. And I'd imagine he wants his cast to, to go the way he directs them, not because they've spoke to the actor that can do this. And in line of that, I'll bring up some, I wouldn't call it controversy as such. Obviously, without going to any of the Facebook real life counterparts, people that worked there, involved there, a lot of them have come out and criticized not just the film, but the book as well. Uh, Eduardo Sabrin, one of them. I kind of love to ask this to you because we're in this weird day and age of social media, right? And, and I haven't seen Priscilla. I don't know if you have. I would have seen it by the time the festival's done. When, so, and it, it's going to be a case by case scenario. That, so I guess this question is maybe half invalid, but. Normally, if, if the real life people for a film come out and like, I absolutely hated this, I detest what they've done here. Normally, I'm inclined to agree with them. But as I've got older, I've sort of realized that most of the time it's because they don't like how they've been represented on screen. Yeah. Depends obviously on the context of the film, the character, the performance. A lot of the time, I still, you know, you can pull and pick examples, right? The unofficial Bowie film that the whole family were like, we've tried to block this film, we legally can't. We've watched as much as we can for being official. I've never watched that, and I will never watch that. Priscilla, the estate, want nothing to do with it, but Priscilla's involved in real life. So I'm like, hmm. And it's Sophia Coppola. I'm like, there's got to be something else there they don't want people to know about. And then other times, you know, you get a film where you just want to watch it, and all the cast like, this is great. This is exactly how it was for us. And then it turns out that it's just some insane self-promotion I'm forgetting the most yeah. obvious film that jumps to mind so it's going to alter for each one but if I give my thoughts maybe you sort of segue off as well that I love the fact that everyone involved at Facebook doesn't like this film that they're not happy with how they were represented um, there's one actor I can completely understand um, which is uh, Max Mangala plays Devaya Narendra now, the criticism there is that they had an English actor playing someone of, of, of Asian descent. So I understand that a bit more. But where I'm going in this conversation is that I don't like how Mark Zuckerberg came across. He has not been like this to me. What are your thoughts on that? Because for me, I don't mind it. But the reason I don't mind it is because Fincher and Sorkin are aware that this they haven't made this film to be like Oppenheimer. I know it's sort of 12 years after. They haven't said this has got to be historically accurate to the most finite detail. They yeah. have said, we want this film to explore these characters and this story. They it's don't weird. care about the real life it's side. So, mate, I massively agree. It's so weird because it's, I love the film, right? And it's clearly not a, a full on representation of who these people are. But I also don't feel like it has to be. It feels like a fake, a, a, a semi real, semi fake retelling of this story. Yeah. which is just absolutely insane. But I just feel like it's done so well. And you're talking about people not being happy with the way they're represented on screen. Look, there's always going to be a bias when it comes to these kind of biopic films. And whether that's a positive bias or a negative bias, it really depends. I watched, for instance, um, last year, Blonde, the Marilyn Monroe film was out. And I hated that film. I thought it was written in such a negative hurtful way about Marilyn Monroe and to make a film about a woman that passed away and to be so negative about this. Why would you make a biopic about someone that you clearly have disdain for and don't like as a person? Because there's no way in hell the filmmaker behind that film had a positive idea of Marilyn Monroe. And I just don't understand why you'd go and make a whole film, spend years of your life dedicating your time and effort to making a film about someone that you just clearly don't like. I find it quite insane. But I do feel like with the social network, there's a clear intrigue behind the characters. And of course, some of them are painted in bad ways. But there's also meaning behind every decision that a character makes. I don't feel like anyone is painted in a truly horrific way in this film. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg is, is an idiot, right? Are you allowed to swear on here? Yes, do what you want. We don't really care. Okay, so Mark Zuckerberg is an absolute dick, right? Obviously, the stuff with the ex-girlfriend, 
and everything and just the way he is. He's he's just a dickhead, yeah. But there's reasoning behind the way he is, and I feel like it's explained in a certain way that doesn't seem too OTT. And again, I don't feel like it's a true representation of any of the characters. I just feel like it's a good way of telling it in a cinematic way. And it also gives every, like everyone is obviously played in the film probably a better, by a better looking person than they are themselves. And we get that a lot with biopic films, right? It's always someone better looking than the person. You get the, 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 at the end, sometimes they'll show the person and the real life character. And it's like, okay, I get it. Like, it, it, they don't look massively alike, but no, I don't really have a problem with the representation on screen. But then again, I don't feel like these are people who are seen in a positive way anyway. Mark Zuckerberg has not been looked at in a massively positive way in 2010 or now. Uh, you know all the alien stuff that comes out and all the stupid stuff anytime he appears anywhere, which obviously is, is ridiculous, but I don't know. There's just something. He's very um, charismatic in this film, which I don't. F and, I, and it sounds. He's got this weird way I'm about him. The, the, he's got like charisma, a... but he's also very much autistic, right? Like he's got that autistic autistic traits, right, in the film. Yeah, which I, That's... Which I don't really see. Obviously, autism is something that seems to be very much in the spotlight over the last few years, and seems to be getting higher and higher, and the awareness is much higher. But there was certain the way he was on screen was like someone that has a aut autism, but also had a lot of charisma about him as well. It was it was a weird kind of a mesh between the two, um, and I thought Jesse Eisenberg was was fantastic in bringing that character to light. Yeah, and that was a great point because I was going to bring up Jesse Eisenberg. That I believe in real life he's got OCD, and he spoke about this being one of his most challenging performances because he had to really like go into that with somebody like. Mark Zuckerberg and the opening scene you mentioned earlier, going irrespective of the screenplay as well. In terms of set, setting the tone, what to expect from your character, put him in a, a social situation away from a screen. We get everything we need to know about how inept he is at talking to people, what he's like with reading social scenarios, all these sorts of things. And is a really smart way to bring that character in. Then you go to its court cases, then you go into this. And I think what compensates the performances, the script is Finch's direction and certainly the narrative structure. The fact that it is a very conscious decision to go back and forth between the court cases and the past, I think is, again, I kind of appreciate this as a 14-year-old. I'm sure other 14-year-olds probably did. Um, but certainly watching it now, it was quite remarkable seeing how, how it not speeds up time, but it, it's, we don't need to see the moments. We don't want to see it at the start and then say, oh, look, they're, they're suing you for something you did an hour ago. This film, it doesn't need that. It needs to absolutely go in, in sync with it and, and it absolutely nails the narrative. And kind of with Fincher's direction, the question, I mean, I know this is Tate's favourite Fincher film. The question I have on the direction, and, and it's so tough because I, I, I can pick my favourite Fincher films and they're all completely different in terms of story, thematics, direction. His direction differs film to film. My question sort of is going to go into at some point, is this David Fincher's best directed film? And I know it's not like snobbery to say this. And me and you've had this chat about like Dunk preluding Oppenheim. We've had this chat about Dunkirk, right? Dunkirk isn't our favorite Nolan film, but in respect of directing the craft, the technical, it's, it's definitely mine. Yeah. And, and this is how I had always been that I, I favorite. I'd always have Dark Knight or Inception, but Best, I'd have Dunkirk. And I think there's a massive difference between what you enjoy and what you believe is better. And I know that not 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 criticising other people is in all forms of life, right? It's the same with football when we talk about that. I've got footballers I hate, uh, and I can't acknowledge they're good, but I won't. And at the same time, my favourite footballer is always going to be different to who I think the best footballer is. That that's, that's just black and white as it should be. And it's really interesting with Finch that after watching this, again, I'm, I'm we're going through them. We've still got Dragon Tattoo, Gone Girl, Mank and the Killer is this David Fincher's best film or is this his best directed film and I have to agree I think this is his best directed film I think having that screenplay to begin with is the the best head start he can have and he runs with it him and Sorkin they just click whether he tinkered with it I don't know I don't have details of that 
I can imagine this being a perfect screenplay, if I'm being honest. But if Fincher did tinker with it, then I, it's very, it's not noticeable. I don't know if I waffled too much there, if that makes sense. No, I, I don't. I don't think Fincher would have messed about with the screenplay. I don't. I don't actually know how in depth he goes with the screenwriters, and I know a lot about his directing style and his approach on on filmmaking for sure. But when it comes to his approach with writers, because you were talking earlier about how people can have different projects running, obviously yeah. we're fully aware of the Spielberg stuff, right? When he had a uh, Jurassic Park and Schindler's List basically running at the same time, which is obviously insane. Some people can do it, some people can't. But I think a lot of it has to do with uh, directors who also write their own material. So yeah. someone like Christopher Nolan, who obviously his brother Jonathan helps him write the scripts, but they would have pretty much full control over everything from position A to position Z. Whereas someone like Fincher, who's getting scripts from writers, it'll be a slightly, a slightly different scenario. So I don't know how much he gets involved with the script writing. Um and how much it affects his there definitely may be some tinkering on days of shooting yeah i think when someone but i do feel like he's a perfectionist so i do feel like they would go into it with a pretty much complete as much completed script as you can have of course things might change on the day because when you could do as many table read throughs you could do as many i don't know again a lot of these films don't have chances to do rehearsals right yeah. So unless you're doing rehearsals beforehand, you're doing a table read, until you get these actors in on the set, in front of each other, in the dress, the accent, whatever it may be, depending on the role, it, it's hard to tell with the script. And of course, when you're reading it themselves before going through to shoot, it's probably like, oh, this is amazing. But there may be some tinkering that, is, that needed to be done throughout. Um but yeah, I, I direct back to his directing. I do think it's his best directed film. I just feel like it's his best film overall. And he he he's just got some unbelievable films, doesn't he? It's kind of when you're speaking about one of your favorite directors, it's always hard to say this is their best. I do always seem to have a film like you talk about Nolan. For me, Nolan is his best film is Dunkirk. Tarantino, his best film for me is Pulp Fiction. And with Fincher, I think, is The Social Network. It just happens to be that I think that they are their best films and they're also my favourite. Maybe I just feel that way. I don't know. I don't know, to be honest, when it comes to the best and favourite. But The Social Network is 100% my favourite Fincher film. Like, it's just not... It's not like, a, oh, my God, what am I going to do when it comes to my ranking? It's... Where what's going to go two through to seven or two through to eight, wherever it may be? Yeah, number one is always the social network, without a doubt. Yeah, I, I kind of I'm, I'm agreeing with there as well. I, I do think this is his best film, especially of, of what we've watched so far. And I just think his direction is second to none. That there's not a single second wasted. It's not got an overly long runtime. It's and I missed Benjamin Button last week. And that film's two hours forty five minutes long, but it's, it's telling. Insane. I'm just uh, thinking. Sorry, it's mate. I'm just in. thinking right. in my head about the like. You know, you're like you're forgetting about some of the films he has, like Seven, so Fight different. Club, Seven, yeah. Fight Club, Gone Girl, The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. There's so many different, so many different. It's like, it's like not just genre, but it's yeah, just, the different yeah, genre, like, styles, different type of writers, different scripts, different act, completely different actors going for different things. Just unbelievable filmography and. Again, you know that these like Tarantino, but his films very much all feel Tarantino like his film. films, right? You can tell it's a Tarantino film. Nolan, I feel like it's the, the same. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro, same type of thing. You can always tell it's his film. Obviously, the biggest one is is bloody Wes Anderson, right? Yeah. Um and obviously when you delve deeper into these directors and you know in the cinematographers they work with and you understand why they do what they do, the reasons behind what they do, and kind of their trademarks it's easier yeah. to, to tell but with fincher i can't re really look at his films and see like trademarks per se i just he think his trademark is making bangers like, yeah like yeah he doesn't have it's not like obviously with scorsese filmer edits all his films right sally menk edited all tarantino's films before she passed away like there's normally like a recurring person that's involved with 
directors and writers films. But with Fincher, he just seems him. to use actors. Every every single component of making a film seems to change. And that just shows how good he is as a director. Because obviously the director is the one that's meshing all these things together in the end, right? Yeah. It just shows how good he is as a director. And I think, for me, anytime anyone asks your favorite director, director and filmmaker are two completely different things. And I, I do feel like there needs to be a different kind of measurement for directing and filmmaking because they're two completely different arts. And I don't think anyone's a better filmmaker per se because they write their own stuff i just feel like people seem to get involved in much more but fincher his trademark is just bangers i think that's his that's his trademark right just making unbelievable films he knows exactly what he wants his film to be and he has this this is the weirdest comparison you're going to get i've mentioned george lucas a lot in this era so far very different people but i'm sort of citing our alien three to lucas's early career where he had this horrible experience with a big studio very early on. Put him off the idea of doing films. Obviously, that didn't happen to Lucas. But when Fincher, I say, came back, you know, end up doing a second film, it's seven. And his approach to every film after is, it's it's my film. I'm going to choose what we do here. And I really respect that. And I also appreciate that not every director can have that, especially in this day and age of the streaming era where... A lot of directors are getting more opportunities with, you know, all these Netflix films that somehow get funding, not citing the fact they fund these films. It's more, where does Netflix's money come from? Um, and I like the fact there is creative, you know, differences and whatnot. But with Fincher, I think that's so set in stone with his personality. And at this point of his career with this film, this is the eighth film. A few episodes ago, we started talking, I think Panic Room was the first time with the murmurs of, they had to do a lot of takes for this for this one. Um, then we get to, uh, oh God, I've got uh, Zodiac, right? And you've got uh, Ruffalo, Gyllenhaal, and Downey, like, we had to do 50 takes or something. I think at this point in time, the, the not only the actors, but the industry, I don't want to say is aware. They were probably aware anyway. Maybe in respect to public domain might have been aware. Stuff online. In this day and age, things getting online, more film productions. But if you're a cast, if you're an actor, if you're casting David Fincher film, you go in with the uh, probably knowledge that you, sometimes you'll do 50, 60 takes or something. And there's a scene in this where there were 99 takes done by, um, I said Mark, so by Jesse Eisenberg, sorry. Um, I love this about him that if he made actually 99 takes and there were 99 shit takes and the one they put in the film is dreadful, then yes, that's the director. I can't ever look at a Fincher film and say, this performance was absolutely rubbish. This scene is rubbish. The pacing's off. Why is this like this? Yeah. His best quality is his perfectionism. And I hate using that so much in discussions online, but it is really his approach to, to filmmaking that it is going to go his way and he will make sure the actress knows it goes, it's going to go his I way. I find it, yeah. I find it weird when people moan about uh, directors and filmmakers and the amount of takes that they, they do. Yeah. I, I there's a certain egotistical side of it when it comes to actors moaning about doing so many takes because they obviously feel like the first take is perfect and they're an all great actor. But I think there's when you step onto a, fi- a film set, you need to understand that you're there to do a job. You're being paid to do a job, right? And if you're an actor, you are there to act and you are doing a performance offer something different if the only if the director wants to do 100 takes there's a reason behind that they're trying to get something else and potentially they might use the the third take out of 100 you never know but they may be just looking for that spark that is not easy to come by and sometimes when it comes to acting i feel like you when you work on a film and a director's willing to do 100 takes You're going to try to do different things. You're going to work on different angles. You may potentially be a little bit more open to what you would try. Whereas if you're working on a film where it's okay, we're going to do five, six takes and that's it. You're going to be very much more precise about what you're doing. And you're not going to allow yourself to be open for experimentation, which as an actor, that's why people, well, I know I used to bloody love it when I was an actor doing kind of um, 
just kind of going off script and being able to do your own thing because you kind of fall into the character itself and it brings you to different places that you didn't know you could get the character to. And the script it only does one thing. But when you go off script and you're starting to delve into the mental psyche of the character that you're you're performing, it's completely different. So I have no problem with the amount of takes that he does. I understand why he does what he does. And yes, it may be annoying to some actors, but you're being paid to act. Just act. I don't know why it's a big thing. I know the... Um, Again, I know Eyes Wide Shut. I think Harvey Keitel got fired, basically, or quit because they were making him do so many different takes of opening a door or something. And he was like, I'm not doing it no more. And it's like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to. But by then, you knew what you were getting into. If someone does a, yeah. a film with Stanley Kubrick back in the day, you knew you were going to be maybe doing 60 takes of something very simple. But there's a reason behind it. And I think with Fincher, people know what they're getting themselves into. And I feel like this film with the script being as tight as it is, giving yourself that wiggle room to try new things, it just shows how good the perform. I think everyone in this film is spectacular. There's not a yeah. single bad performance on show. And again, like you were saying, Jesse Eisenberg, you're doing a hundred takes. If you're watching the film and you're like, I don't, I know a lot of actors don't watch their own performances back, which I find insane. Spending all that time doing it. again, egotistical. Actors seem to have this idea and it's famous people as a whole and rich people have this idea that they're above uh, everything else. And they've got to that kind of age where it's, Oh, this is my job. I do it for the public. And it's just a load of bullshit in my opinion. Um, but yeah, you'd be very disappointed if your one bad take ended up being the one that made it in the film. <laughs> but I it's, doubt it's an interesting point. It. Especially, I mean, I always jumped to Alan driver, right? He's my favorite actor, but, isn't his his is more like psychological, like he physically can't watch himself. I think he talks about it, doesn't he? That he's always throughout watching his performances, which is probably like self-criticism to an, ex well, not an extent, to an extremity. But I'm with you on that. And the one thing I found fascinating with Fincher, and again, I, I missed last week's, almost every leading, but certainly with Zodiac, right? We were having this discussion that all these actors and the multiple takes and, and the stuff they want to moan about, they can moan about the multiple takes. And whether they come out of context, we don't know. I'm sure these days it's probably the killer's going to come out and the source going to say to Fassbender, so did you have any issues doing X amount of takes? And what I find interesting with Fincher is how many actors do a Finch film and that ends up being arguably the best film of their career. Maybe best performance of their career. Maybe not best film, sorry. Well, uh, Downey like, Jr., that's one of his... Zodiac is, is regarded yeah. as one of his best performances, right? Right up there you look, for at me. Edward Norton, you look at Edward Norton and Brad Pitt, Fight Club is going to yeah. be up there. Jesse Eisenberg, this is a hundred percent. Garfield, there's and that's what well. no, actually that's Garfield. What I found is oh, he's got um, the in the musical, um, the musical, which I hate musicals. Yeah, but I forgot the name of it. There's no, um, there's no denying in that film he was insane. And this is it, and that's why I've sort of appreciated more across this is the perf the performances he's getting out of his leading actors or supporting actors, whoever is on yeah, screen. Jodie Foster, this. Panic Room, fantastic. Yeah. Kristen Stewart, Stewart in one of her one of her first ever performances is so so good in that film. Gone Girl, Jesus yeah. Christ, Ben Affleck is unbelievable in that film, and Rosamund Pike, what a performance she puts in. That's one of the that is an iconic iconic performance. Man, he's yeah, you're right. He's and this is it. He gets the best performances out of his actors, and yeah, I think that's what astounds me. Again, if it's this more modern day of they're just trying to bait for actors to moan about it, but I find it fascinating because we don't hear about other directors that do a lot of takes, and you don't hear about other actors talking about it. But Fincher is justified, and the further we get into his career, to me, the more justified that gets. That as you said earlier, you know what you're going to be getting in for. You know what you're signing up for with a Fincher film. Say maybe you went on a Nolan film, you should expect to do something practical. You know you're going to be shooting on film with big IMAX cameras around. And I like that directors have their pers personalities on the productions, not just... Again, we mentioned earlier that you, I love when you talk about the difference of filmmakers and directors. Uh, the the go-to Spielberg, right? I think he's he's wrote one film, which was The Fablemans, which is understandable. And he co-wrote The Fablemans as well. Yeah. He well, knows. The Fablemans makes sense, in it? It's kind of yeah. a film about himself, right? If and there's anyone that can write that film, it's him. He knows his strengths, and his strengths are the, the, the best cinemas probably ever had. 
And he also yeah. will surround himself by the best people available. He knows that can make his film. And George Lucas, again, a, a great example, and maybe a wrong way, the Star Wars prequels. Somebody that has, I say trust issues is an understatement of the life. George Lucas had no intention of directing the Star Wars prequels, but he had to because he did not believe that anybody else, he did not trust anybody else except the three or four people who all declined it to do so yeah and i find it really interesting and that to me is a, a, a massive thing and for fincher again to, to jump from genre to, i don't even want to call it genre jumping because that's like a discredit his just his filmmaking and and let's talk some of the actors in this because we spoke about what it is for a director to get a performance out of the leads jesse eisenberg is mark zuckerberg again i'm the same as you right mark zuckerberg I, i'm not i'm not not unfamiliar. I know Mark Zuckerberg more through meme culture, right? I know now he's absolutely ripped and he has like a black belt in like MMA or, or whatever it is he does. And he might have a case. Yeah, he, has a, black, <laughs> he has a black belt in jujitsu, which is pretty insane. It doesn't seem like a physical person at all. And jujitsu seems to be the, the, the big kind of martial art at the moment that people are getting into. Every five to 10 years, every kind of decade, there's a new one that everyone wants to do, right? Where yeah. MMA, UFC pipe was big when Conor McGregor was going off. That was the thing. Jiu-Jitsu seems to be the big kind of martial art that people want to do. Um, yeah, and that seems to be what he is involved in at the moment. Yeah, and, and big up Jesse Eisenberg if he, they do do a sequel and he gets absolutely shredded. Um, but what I love about the performance in this is, again, well, Jesse Eisenberg was able to bring his own stamp onto it. What I was reading is that Although again, they didn't have access to Facebook. Obviously, Zuckerberg wouldn't. They wouldn't have likely given access anyway. I'm sure someone have tried to advise, but Jesse Eisenberg based the costume off photos of Mark Zuckerberg in public. So very much the outfits and stuff that had been seen of Mark Zuckerberg contextually online at the time, which I kind of like. And again, that's Fincher giving his actors a bit of freedom. It's not. It's not like um, the Coen Brothers, right, where you're you're with us or you're against us in respect to what you're allowed to do on a set or, or what you follow. There is this creative freedom. And I think Mark, just, I keep calling him Mark Zuckerberg. It's because it, I'm not saying he becomes him, but this is really Jesse Eisenberg's film. And it's interesting that I, I'm not saying it's not spoken about because Jesse Eisenberg isn't a household name. I'm trying to think of him. Like, not that I'm comparing him to, to Paul Dano, but he's... He's one of these actors that I am yet to see a bad performance from. Now, I'm sure there could be one or two if someone tells me or points out something obvious I'm missing. But the projects they do are not necessarily big studio projects. Okay, yes, he was in Batman versus Superman. Of course, we knew about that. Uh, and that was literally Zack Snyder saying, I want my Lex Luthor to basically be like a Mark Zuckerberg type. I'm just going to cast the guy that played him in the social network. Um, and Jesse Eisenberg's not, I quite liked him in that film. Uh, if I'm being honest, I didn't have a problem with him. The issue of that film is the script and everything else. Um, and also, it's, speaking of Ben Affleck, you mentioned him earlier, of course, great in that film too. Uh, and in Gone Girl, we will talk about Gone Girl in a few weeks. But what were your thoughts on his performance? Because I, again, I can't really fault it. And I just think because it's a unique performance that if you show this to a normal person, they just think like it's like a nerd thing, right? They're talking very quick or they're doing this, they're doing that. It's none of that. And I think how Jesse Eisenberg works as an actor is also perfectly suited to a Fincher film and, and this script as a whole, that they haven't just nailed the casting. Everyone feels appropriate. I'm not saying Jesse Eisenberg go talk at hundred miles an hour, but he is to an extent that that script is absolutely flying because of his performance and and if he is doing multiple takes of massive monologues of it language and all that sort of stuff i couldn't imagine what this is like on set from doing it again and again and again and again uh and i kind of love it for it yeah i think his performance is is fantastic again is it like mark zuckerberg is who knows right really and truly we don't see enough of him outside of press conferences where he's talking about meta and AI for me to have a full, a full understanding of who he is as a person and obviously who he is now and who he was during the making of the making of Facebook and the court cases is someone completely, completely it's different. They're right? kids really, aren't they? They're, they're like kids. in their twenties. Exactly. And which makes the whole thing insane. When I watch this film, I just think I feel so inferior as a human, when I watch films like this and you just see the raw genius 
the human capability is one of the most outstanding things for me. And people like Mark Zuckerberg, obviously you have creative side, right? You have David Fincher, the yeah. people that, and Jesse Eisenberg, you have Mark Zuckerberg. There's so many different ways of just pure genius. And I've always been astounded by representation of genius in media. And I do feel like we don't, Obviously, you don't want to kind of martyr anyone. And obviously, you don't want to really martyr someone that made Facebook. It's not the, the big type of thing. But the algorithm scene where they're yeah. ranking the girls, right? Like, And the pacing is just boom, boom, boom. The score is so on point, yeah? And it, the way it flicks from... Again, it's just hard not to go back to the script. And everything just combines together. The score the script, the performances, everything just kind of works in it. I just think of an engine in a car and all a car running, all these different components, like the battery has to be fully functional, right? The conveyor belt, the wheel, like there's so many different engineering as a whole is just insane. And mm -hmm. filmmaking is very much engineering, right? You need to engineer everything to, to work for this film to run from, from start to finish. And rambling a bit, <laughs> of course. No, it's, no, it's not. It's fine. It's just there's something about his performance in this film that I just adore, and the way he is different in different stages. He's a completely different character during the interview process with the lawyers, uh, with the Winklevoss twins and Edward Saverin, Eduardo Saverin. Sorry, when they're doing the uh, the court and the uh, sorting out the kind of money they're going to give them for stealing the idea and kicking him out of the company. And then he's completely different in the scenes of Erica. Uh, he's completely different with the scenes with his flatmates. And then also the scenes with um, Jesus Christ. I can't remember the character's name that I know the guy who runs Napster. Um, Sean Parker. Sean Parker. Yeah. Thank you. I keep thinking of the scene with um, uh, what's her name? What is that woman's name again? The cocaine scene or the girlfriend scene with him? The girlfriend scene with Sean Parker. What's her name? She's from falling in love 50 with him. Shades of, Fifty Shades of Grey, the woman from that. Oh, Dakota Johnson. Dakota Johnson, yeah, whose bum, sorry to be a bit crude and a bit misogynistic, but her bum in the social network is absolutely insane in that scene. So that's my misogyny moment, but... I just feel like his character is completely different in all these scenes and all these different segments, different times in his life and the way he um, kind of bounces between the different scenes. And that really allows the different times that the film is shot and the chronological order to make so much more sense to me. You can see kind of the progression of himself and the way he treats people around him. Um, but no, I think the overall performance was unbelievable. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you on that. And uh, you know what's really, really bad? I didn't actually realize it was Dakota Johnson until about an hour ago. <laughs> I was doing the research on it. Yeah, I, this would have been one of the first roles, I guess, as well. To be fair, it, I, it's the first thing I ever remember seeing her in. Obviously, I don't remember it was her at the time, but when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, I remember clicking on to who exactly it was. Interesting. That's fair. And um, you mentioned a couple of us. Let's, let's talk Andrew Garfield. Um, I'm just going to get the S bit out of the way. Spider-Man. Um, this obviously came out before The Amazing Spider-Man. Strangely enough, this wasn't the first thing I saw him in. Uh, I saw him in the... Uh, oh, my God. I've forgotten the name already. The Imaginarium of Dr. Pa Penicius. I can never remember how to pronounce it. The uh, Heath Ledger's yeah, final film. the Terry film. Gilliam film, right? Yeah. And yeah. I believe he was in Doctor Who once as well. But I can't... A lot of British actors have been and, and, and will always be in there. Yeah. But I, I love him in this. And I think if you look at the... Again, not to... Not to sort of discredit what I've said about Jesse Eisenberg, that obviously, you know, you get cast as Spider-Man. Only three people have played him in live action. It's the one of the, the biggest roles in history. Career momentum changing after that. I love the fact that Garfield's come out of his Spider-Man stuff and has been able to... Uh, I, I don't want to sound rude and say do acting, but it was clear pre-Spider-Man yeah. he was going to have a pretty great career. He's the best Spider. It not, might not be the best Spider Man. I still feel I I love Tobey Maguire's Spider Man, but he's definitely the best actor that has played Spider. -Man. Yeah, 
yeah, that that's where I'm trying to go with it. And I like the fact that his career isn't now like he played. I love Toby and I want Toby back in films. But it doesn't matter what you put Toby Maguire in, he'll be Spider-Man. It doesn't matter what you put Tom Holland in, he'll be Spider-Man. I think people look at Andrew Garfield and they genuinely see Andrew Garfield. They see Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. Not yeah, I, I massively agree. But again, I do feel like he is the best actor to have played yeah. Spider-Man. And I do... I, Tom Holland, look, I don't think he's a bad actor, but I also don't think he's great either. I do feel like he's getting a he's lot... picked good and roles it, outside. That guy needs to sack his agent. Sack your agent because you're picking the worst possible roles outside of the MCU stuff. Everything he's been in, I feel like he's been... A, all the Devil All the Time or something that was on Netflix with Tom Hardy... Yeah. Decent enough. And or was it Robert Pattinson he was in with? Pattinson was in that was. as well. Um, he was decent in that, but like, that was a decent film. But I just feel like, again, nothing to do with the social network. So let's get off of that. But uh, yeah, yeah. Toby, Toby Maguire was the best Spider-Man, but Andrew Garfield is 100% the best actor to play him. And this was the first role that I remember being like, oh, okay. Brilliant yeah. actor. Where's he going to go? And what I kind of like, sort of segueing the, the chat, sticking with the performance, is that, again, not getting into the Oppenheimer discussion, but some actors have to, you know, some, and again, it's a director's approach, they're entitled to it. I want my actor to fundamentally look exactly like the person the counterpart did. None of this cast yeah. looks like any of their counterparts, but that's because David Finch is getting the best actors for this he can. And I actually love Andrew Garfield as, as Eduardo in this. And what I was reading, which really astounded me, was that Andrew Garfield went for the role of Mark Zuckerberg. And I, I, maybe not that I can't ever see it. I guess it'd be the haircut that does it first and foremost. But that's also a credit to Jesse Eisenberg to such a phenomenal performance in this film. So I also your, can't see anyone else doing it. Where's your head in relation to kind of like biopics and stuff? Because I always feel like if I know <sighs> about a character, if I know, if they just say, for instance, they're doing a biopic about John Claude Van Damme, yeah? John Claude Van Damme is I know when we talk about actors, Daniel Day Lewis is for me the greatest actor of all time, right? But yeah. if we're talking about what like John Claude Van Damme was my guy growing up, like his films, I loved his films, yeah. If a, they were making a film about his life, I would probably want someone that looks like him, and I would want yeah. the the idea of him to be his essence to be portrayed on screen. But if it was a biopic of someone that I don't know. I also don't have any premeditated idea of who this person is. That's why I don't have a problem with the social network. And even though I now have a bit of understanding of the people that they're portraying, yeah. the film's forever imprinted on my mind before that information came to fruition. So I don't know. Where do you stand on biopics and how close do you feel they have to be to the actual person and is it a case of again back to the the blonde thing it's, how how really close do you have to be to what you believe and how because obviously i've just explained how it affects me dependent on knowing about the character or not what's your opinion on that i'm i'm in a similar boat to you right it's it's really tricky because i don't know if it makes me a hypocrite if my i think first and foremost it depends on on the director if there's a director who has a bit of gravitas, who has a bit of class, I don't care that it doesn't look like the person. If they're creative, I'm trying to think of the right word. It's really hard to talk about. If if the creative approach and the storytelling mechanics are in place for the film to function as it's intended to be, I don't mind. But then it also it depends on the person they're doing a biopic of. And it's it's not to sort of potentially slate real life people or not, but I'm looking at Oppenheimer, obviously it came out this year, right? And it's just outgrossed Bohemian Rhapsody as as the highest grossing biopic of all time. I didn't really know that that's the thing, but they made it a thing. Um, like a lot of people, I love the musical Queen. I can sing along to it. Great, great on night out. I thought Rami Malek looks exactly like Freddie Mercury, which is what I guess people want in association to it. And I've got to say, it's one of the, the worst Oscar wins of my lifetime for best actor, based on the fact that... yeah he's not singing so but at the same time i don't i wouldn't want a queen i wouldn't want freddie mercury's not like freddie mercury but my it's issue the performance size though isn't it yeah the and, but then between the performance and winning awards exactly, and the actual and, film itself is different and, austin and butler is elvis unbelievable love austin butler i love him and i didn't like the film personally that much but his performance is undeniably yeah 
And he didn't Brilliant. drop the voice for a year after, which is equally as entertaining. And what, where I'm kind of with Bohemian Rhapsody, and I, I look back, and this was my biggest issue with it when it came out, and it actually gets worse and worse for me. As now we're getting musical film after biopic after biopic, right? Yeah. Taron Edgerton to me doesn't look like Elton John, but Elton John picked him. Elton John had creative control on his own film. But it's a and vibe more so to look, right? Does he yeah. have the aura of Elton John? Does he have that and vibe that's... that he's trying to bring to screen? I don't think Killian Murphy looks like Oppenheimer either. He doesn't. No, but and I know this is way out there. But there's they've just made a live action One Piece, which is the anime and the anime manga show. Japanese, and and the actor doesn't look for me like Luffy, who's the main character. But once the episode once starts, starts kicking on and the character gets in, he has the essence, and you believe that he is the character. He doesn't have to look identical. And that's why I don't really believe in the prosthetic stuff that they do sometimes to make people look identical to the character. It all just yeah. seems a little bit too much for me. Um, I, th I think again, it's my, the essence, isn't it? I think yeah. I think my 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 honest approach, and it's hard to have an honest approach because someone could list a film or a genre. I think I don't. If if the performance is good enough, if the story, if all the mechanics are in place, I don't mind that the actor doesn't look exactly like this person. Yeah. If the actor looks exactly like a person, gives a horrible performance. And I tell you what, it, it's 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 not related, but it sort of is. Uh, we, the finale of Thrawn hasn't aired yet, and the big talking point is if they do a Star Wars film, if they do a Thrawn film, again, the Ahsoka finally hasn't aired, so this is not even speculation. The online discussion is, oh, how are they going to bring back the trio if they were going to put them in this Thrawn... Not, not, not Thrawn film, the Filoni film, sorry. Um, you've got... And everyone's again fan casting. Oh, I want these people de aged. Mm. Old and Ehrenreich played Han Solo in Solo. Massively underrated film. Underperformed film because they released it at the same time as Avengers Infinity War, which Bob Iger has genuinely gone on record and said it's his fault. He wanted it in May. He should never have done that. And then Aqua made a billion in December. Um, if they did the Star Wars film, would I want Old and Ehrenreich in a main Star Wars film to play Han Solo? Yes and no. I really like Alden Ehrenreich as an actor, and I thought he did a great performance. But I didn't want an impersonation of Harrison Ford in a film, and that's what Luke's one didn't want at the time. I know we're way off off topic now, but it's it. Every single project's going to have that different vibe for me. Of a biopic is always going to come down to if it's a, a musician or somebody I'm aware of, I've got an attachment to. I would want the authenticity to go with it. Um, yeah. At the same time, if I don't, I'm far more open to. Okay, I hope the film's good, and I'll just accept it doesn't like it. What I don't excuse is Freddie Mercury. You've now got AIDS just in time for us to go and do Live Aid at Wembley. That's yeah. Where... I also don't <laughs> feel like with something like this. Obviously, with these musicians, we're talking about. I think they're making a Michael Jackson decades and now, decades. Right? So, like Michael yeah. Jackson, we know everyone. Everyone and their aunt knows Michael Jackson. Knows who knows the story. You'd be. You'd be hard done by to find someone who isn't aware of Michael Jackson and who he is as a person, right? Yeah. So that film is probably going to be slightly different than, okay, they're making a film about the person, like Blackberry is a film that's just is just had a uh, cinema screen the, the other day, yeah? I could not care less about who is playing the people behind the making of the Blackberry phone because I have no idea who these people are. Is that what it's about? I just, I just thought that was a name for it. No, yeah, it's about the creation of the BlackBerry phone, I believe. Fuck. So it's all about... <laughs> so it's all. It's very much for me... I want it to be an intriguing and enticing film that has something about it. So I could not care less about who plays the people that are behind yeah, I'm making it a BlackBerry. And I do feel like with the social network, the casting is fantastic. I feel like the performances are brilliant. And again... If I had known about these people and had in-depth knowledge of them and their characteristics, their traits, maybe their mannerisms, the way they speak, because again, it's just, a, again, this is going to go completely off topic, but it's something I feel like I have to say because of where we're at. Say it, it's fine. The, the, the Oscars and the award ceremonies and this idea that we always give the a winner to a biopic, I personally feel it's much harder to create a compelling character from a script where you're completely making that character up from everything to the, the voice, the cadence, the way they walk, the, the smile, everything is created. That for me is acting, right? Mimicking someone else is not acting. You're just kind of copying what someone yeah. else is doing. 
So, um, it's, it's, again, it's the middle like, of that, it, right? It, that's, it, it, yeah, it's finding, a, the middle. it's finding a middle ground. And that, that's where I'm with you. And I think this film, and I'll go back to our Zodiac video. Um, we spoke about how you go contextually to 2007, Robert Downey Jr. It's not Iron Man at that point in time. Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang's come out. He's not Iron Man yet. The film has not released. Sorry, it's probably filmed by then. Jake Gyllenhaal has been in a few things. He's done Donnie Darko's and Death of Tomorrow. He isn't probably as well known as he is now. Mike Ruffalo is not the Hulk yet. Mike Ruffalo's probably done a bit more than people would make Finch up. Finch had a lot of people end up in superhero movies, man. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what we sort of spoke about was those three have had incredible careers in respective of status across the nominations, wins, franchises, whatever you want to do. Across that, since post Ojax release, their careers have come on leaps and bounds, which has, in retrospect, enhanced Zodiac to a certain degree. The, what we spoke of Robert Dan Jr., right? Oh, we talk about that as being one of his best performances. I know that we're going to have a whole Oscar campaign with him and Oppenheimer, which I, I thought his performance in that film is absolutely incredible. He called Oppenheimer the best film of his career. Whether he's saying that, that upset a lot of Marvel fans. Um, but I I certainly think Robert Downey Jr. has the right to say that about his own career. I've not seen Chaplin, so I can't directly compare it to that. But um, where I am with segueing social network is you look at 2010, I, I sort of said right at the beginning, right? Garfield's not Spider-Man yet. The actors in this, bar Arnie Hammer, for obvious reasons. Um, I shouldn't laugh. A cannibal. Um, so weird. Um, I'm still processing that he's a cannibal still. That's what I'm trying to read how not to laugh and why I'm about to say something serious. But they've all gone on to do well as an understatement. One of them became Spider-Man. One became next to you. But there's your franchises. Tick that out of the way. They've all had accolades. They've Garfield's probably had the, the biggest career of anybody in this film. And I want to kind of pinpoint Justin Timberlake, who we've not really spoke about yet, who I think is wonderful in this. He is at this, I mean, you think, I don't want to say I forget how big he is, but obviously I was very young in the early 2000s when he was like probably the, the peak of his popularity. You weren't, you weren't about during NSYNC and I, I can and tell you what I remember. In year seven at album school, and everything. In year seven at school, all the girls fancied him. And that was the same year he did that music video and rap with, I've forgotten the name of the person. Was it with 50 Cent? I can't remember. My music knowledge is so he bad. Did, he does have a tune with 50 Cent, AO Technology. Might, that's it, because that was everyone's ringtones in year seven. Um, so that, I was showing my age. But um, you, you take the logic of, okay, I know Justin Big done a few films before Social Network, I know he's done a few after. You look at his filmography. Social Network stands out by a gazillion miles compared to his other stuff. And actually, which I discovered that Fincher directed Timberlake in a music video as well, which is really interesting. So they had worked with each other before. Um, but I'm looking at his performance the same and looking at Garfield or them. Justin Timberlake's obviously has been more popular prior to this, but he hasn't had a better performance in films that have followed. I think he's just had one out on Netflix, which always sums it up. One out on Netflix. Yeah, he's in a film. I think Javier Bardem's in that film as well. Yeah. And... um. Again, Garfield, he's a Spider-Man, right? And he's done... Oh, it's going to annoy me. I'm just bringing up out of respect because it was a fantastic film, the musical we both spoke about. Um, dear me, that's going to really annoy me. Where's it Begins gone? with a T. Oh, that's so it frustrating. With a T. It's not even on the front of his Wikipedia page now. Um, no, tick, tick, boom. T, I know. I of course it was. <laughs> I knew uh, it began with a T. I just couldn't work And he was it. also great in Tammy Faye. I didn't like the film, but I thought he was great in that. Oh, no, I love that big, film. Dead again. Big favourite of yours, Jessica Chastain, getting that in there. Yeah, big, big fan. <laughs> um, I, I would... He's the support in this, so he's like a co-lead slash support, but Tick, Tick, Boom's his best performance. But to me, that took 10 plus years to get a better performance. I've not seen Hacksaw Ridge, so I've got to put my hands up and say I've not seen... I and I've not, really and I've not oh, finished geez. I've not finished Silence, so... There's my hypocrisy there. I've not finished. He's got so Silence. many, so many good performances. Silence yeah. is unbelievable in. Hackshaw Ridge is brilliant. But yeah, I do feel like um, the, the social network is up there for his best performances. And it's so early in his, not early in his career, but it's it's that right. Pre-Spider-Man, boom, here he is, here he is. And I, yeah. I just find it really interesting with sort of talking about his performances and it's because Fincher gets the best out of them. Again, I've not seen all of... Um, Jessica Chastain's no I haven't I'm not sort of Andrew Garfield's either sorry I can't, I, once you start thinking about it you just sort of can't stop I'm being honest um, but Jessica Chastain I, I yeah, feel you 
I, I missed memory at the London Film Festival. They're not doing any press screenings, unluckily. Um, I think they are. I'm sure there's another screening. They, they've screening. done one one pre-festival, none during, unless they had it last minute. I know we're talking. Well, the future, I watched but... it. Yes, I watched it yesterday. Really good film, Memory. So when it comes out, make sure you go check it out. If you like, it's a very deep film. It's not an easy going type of. Let's watch this and on a, on a Friday night before a few drinks. Um, it's definitely an, an emotional and a a film which has some hard hitting subjects: um, dementia, um, sexual assault, uh, death, and stuff like that. So, just a heads up. No, thank you. For that. Again, we've not had the chance to see it. And it's one I do want to watch. Um, and it is one of those where we do get these cut tight films at the festival. And it's always about your mindset heading into them, I do think, as well. Um, without segueing from there, even if Rooney Mara I want to talk about. So I'm, at the time of recording, I've not seen Dragon Tattoo. I know it's the next film on this. I know she's the lead. One of the first actors I think Fincher puts in a supporting role, then puts in a lead role the following film after. I know Leto in, goes from Fight Club's minor, minor role to supporting role in in panic room to an extent but it's really interesting even with her she's she's got really two three scenes and she almost steals the film for me which is always an amazing sign it's a credit to a screenplay and a performance when they can do that but this cast i just i can't sit here and call it one of the best ensemble cast of sin but i can sit there and say for a film that is i'm trying to think of the, again the, the fairest term like not 90 percent dialogue it's a very dialogue heavy film but the performances are so engaging past only having dialogue, the physical performances, the emotions, like what these actors are doing and what Finch is getting out of them. I read something somewhere where they, they reckon there's 560 hours of footage of this film. That's how much there is in total. Now you can imagine your 99 takes and I know, I know you're smiling. It reminds of like, you know, every time a film comes out these days, right? That people don't understand what the difference is between like a rough cut and a first cut to a final cut. I was like, this film is coming at five hours, like released a five hour version. I'm like, it's not how it works. It's never how it's worked. It's just become a bit of a thing because of a certain director who for some reason thinks it's a thing uh, who will remain nameless. But apparently his new film, which is made for Netflix, is already having a director's cut and it's not coming out for two more months. The first the first cut. Make it make sense. Um, sorry, it's a weird tangent. Um, but... Yeah, do you want to say anything about... I don't know if I've glossed over the actors. It's because we've had such a great discussion. We've sort of grouped them all together, which I'm also fine with. Yeah, Rooney Mara they, is they are... fantastic. To speak on Rooney Mara, I think she's absolutely brilliant in the film. That first scene is just... Uh, again, she's only in, really... Again, she's the the first scene... The scene in the, in the restaurant, again, where he sees her with her friends, and the scene when she goes back to the... Um, uh, her dormitory at a university when he's written about her on the blog. They said she's only in three scenes. Yeah, and you're right. She, de she definitely is a scene stealer in every single one of those. And I'm a I'm a um, big fan of Rooney Mara and her sister, um, both brilliant actors. And the the funniest, well, not funniest thing. Sorry, the the fact that she's in the final scene of the film, a photo, her Facebook profile, and that has as much impact as anything else. Um, which I, I think again is how many films you see an opening scene like this? A character gets broken up, but we'll never see that character again. But she's a massive part of this film and why it came to be. And I do believe this is a fictional yeah, character. She's the, she's the antithesis, I don't know how to say the word, but she's the antithesis of the whole thing. She is the reason behind if she didn't exist, Facebook wouldn't exist. And Again, it's just a psychological thing that everything that happens has meaning, right? One kind of argument or one conversation that you have with one person could completely change the way your life goes, right? And not just your life. Facebook has changed millions of people's lives, for better and worse. Some people have met their partners and yeah. their wives and on, on dating apps and Facebook the scene where he's like oh people want to know if you're single or not it's just such a it's just so true isn't it that's why these Part websites are enough. really you always see what, it on facebook it right is. you see something like someone's like oh we've worked out the single wife facebook like and that still happens yeah. 10 plus years later 15 years later and yeah i i wouldn't know it's people's birthdays if it weren't for facebook it's probably yeah, the only reason i have it nowadays is so it doesn't even tell me anymore that's the worst thing about facebook now is that I mainly had it for birthdays and messenger. And now it picks and chooses whose birthdays it wants to tell me. And I end yeah, up missing weird. birthdays for people actually care about. 
Um, but um, that part aside, and also here's a really depressing thought. I had Facebook for over half my life now. That is terrifying to say. Uh, I got Facebook in 2009. I was 13 years old. And last year was that weird divide. I was like, shit, I've had Facebook for half my life. Next up's Twitter. If it survives by that point, that'll be 2011. So Christ almighty. Um, well, you think that's funny. I've been out of school longer than I would have been from school to birth. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. I'm no, yeah, now, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Even... I, yeah. yeah. That's... <laughs> It, yeah, it like, likes oh. weird, isn't it? Like it's where we're just gonna get depressed about our ages and we're not even old. Um <laughs> no, I'm not I'm definitely not depressed about the, the, yeah. the age and stuff like that. It's um, just all so quick. Sure. I still remember my first yeah, life profile goes picture, quick, like, an absolute man. state. Um but I still get reminded they tell you to give you memories on Facebook, don't you? And it's like I'm gonna football. delete that. <laughs> mine's delete like that. 14 year old George is moaning on Facebook yeah. about referees. That hasn't nothing changed. will give you a proper kick up the bum and make you hate your previous self more so than Facebook. So, thank you, Mark yeah. Zuckerberg. Maybe you are memories. a prick, just on purpose. Um, let, let's move on from the characters. You mentioned the score a few times. Let's talk the score Trent Razzler and Ascus Ross. Now, I love myself a soundtrack, and again, because I couldn't really appreciate this film when it came out. I've never listened to the soundtrack outside of like it's popped up a few times, but this is one of the best soundtracks in sync with the film. And I kind of want to say something, and I never know the right words is because I'm not not like musical, but I, I don't have like that music knowledge, right? I'm I'm abysmal with keeping up to date with music. I know my soundtracks, my playlist to Hans Zimmer and John Williams most of the time. That was my revision music at school. It's my music I listen to when I'm working, and then random stuff will pop up. People are so confused about that I listen to as well, not just words with lyrics, but like like just something will pop up and I'm not going to give my music to say, but they're, they're, they're surprised by some of it. And I was really, I've always been in this mindset and Dunkirk did this for me where I remember having argued to people, right? Dunkirk can't be a good soundtrack because it's not fun to listen to. I'm sorry, but since when the fuck did it ever say the soundtrack you have to be able to listen to in your spare time? Like, yes, it's great <laughs> when a soundtrack does that, but the purpose of a soundtrack is to accommodate the moving image on screen is to accommodate the film that goes back to the history of cinema that you had soundtracks before you had actors you could talk in film. And it really frustrates me when I see those sorts of opinions online and, and everywhere else. And what this score does for this film is unbelievable. The fact that what we're once again saying a film about Facebook hasn't just got an incredible director, an incredible writer, the cast, the score to compensate it just moves the film in sync. When they're at a hundred miles now, the soundtracks into the same thing. And, some of the stuff I've read into where uh, the distinct, I don't know if it's like a main theme, but there's three different recordings for the start and end of the film. And the start of the film, the soundtrack's louder and they recorded it close, the piano closer to the microphone. At the end of the film, he recorded it at the other end of the room. So it was still present, but it was quieter. But that's by by storytelling consciousness as well, that it's quieter because of that's where Mike Zuckerberg is at this point. And I thought the score was superb. I'm going to try and listen to it in the next couple of days. I haven't had a chance to do it properly yet. I probably don't want to coach on the way down to the festival. But um, your thoughts on the score? This did win best. This is something I do disagree with. This is just me. Everyone's got their opinions. A better score than Inception? It is not. Uh, oh, so I think I think it, I think it is. I I do think the score is again. I think the film. But I think it's perfect. I just think everything about this film is perfect and the score is just unbelievable. Inception is a fantastic score. And I, I would say this, when it comes to filmmaking as a whole, if there is one section that I'm probably the least knowledgeable about, it would be the music. Like music is probably my least. And don't get me wrong, I listen to music 24-7. At work, in the office, I have music on. When I'm at home, if I'm not watching a film, I have music on traveling anywhere i have music on in my car music on so like music's in my life 24 7 but the actual putting a score over a film i wouldn't know where to start yeah like picking yeah. And not just the score itself but a soundtrack as well so some films only have scores some film have soundtracks and scores some films just have soundtracks i wouldn't know where to start in all honesty and you look at certain films, and again, I always come back to Tarantino because he's my favorite director, but like 
stuck in the middle of you in the ear cutting scene in Reservoir Dogs is a perfect, perfect song for that scene. And I would never in my life think about putting them two together. And then Best of My Love in Boogie Nights at the beginning where they're introducing all the characters in the nightclub. Again, probably a little bit more in line with the time and the type of music that we'll be playing in the club so it makes sense. But it's just a case of do you play something that seems like it, I don't know, the best scores always catch you by surprise and the best scores always leave a lasting impression uh, with you. Like, for instance, uh, The Shape of Water, Alexandra Desplat, that score came on the other day in, in the cinema, the pre- in um, the pitch house before memory played. And immediately, boom, that's The Shape of Water. And it's not a big old uh, Star Wars or Jurassic Park or Jaws type of theme. And I think that really shows a, a brilliant a brilliant score. And I would say that this is the best score of that year. Um, yeah, there's a lot of awards that I would have gave to Social Network. It's, it's again, did it yeah. win Best Picture? No, this is it. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll jump on talking score because we always talk about the legacy of the film. We'll jump in with the Oscar talk. We've not had any for a few, uh, for a few. Uh, Benjamin Button had a, a lot of nominations, but nominated for eight Oscars: Best Film, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Cinematography, Editing, Score, and Sound Mixing. Um, only one editing score and adapted screenplay. Now, in, in, in retrospect, the 2010 Oscars, in my head, I'm trying to scan and remember. Uh, I've, I don't I would think say... Be... Hold on a minute. I would say that those are the best three aspects of the film, however. I could I could agree. Um, but I also I feel t- like getting everything to run together is directing. It should, it should have won Best Picture and directing as well. What won Best Picture that year? That's, that's what I've been trying to load back up for 2000 and... I've got, please don't say this is the year of the King's Speech. I've got a horrible feeling it's the year of the King's Speech. And I actually quite like the King's Speech, if I'm being really honest. Uh, I'm just trying to get to what year that was. I like the King's Speech is why I think Colin Firth and Helena Bonham Carter are fantastic in that film. It's one that's... Performance-wise? Okay, so this this is, here we go. Now, I think this is one of the best Oscar years in the history of my life. Uh, and And it was this year. The King's Speech won. It beat Black Swan. The Fighter, Inception, The Social Network, 127 Hours, The Kids Are All Right, Toy Story 3, True Grit, and Winter's Bone. Um, that is a phenomenal Oscar year. Wow. Uh, what's the King's Speech? I don't mind the King's Speech, but it's what you mentioned about biopics, right? Wow. Biopics do do better. Uh, obviously, Best Actor would, would have lost out to, of course, um, Colin Firth. Black Same Swan film. as well. What Natalie a Portman. film. Yep. Darren Aronofsky. Nat- Natalie Portman must have won best. She actress, won best actress right? that year. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. She won best actress that year. And who won best director then? Uh, oh no, Fincher did win. Apologies. Hold on, no, he didn't. Sorry, this is a bit. This is very strange. The Wikipedia pages have gone very wrong. They've just highlighted. Colin um, for uh, uh, Melissa Leo I won best supporting. Melissa Leo won Best Supporting Actress for The Fighter, which is 100% correct. She's outstanding in that film. And one of the reasons why I initially didn't like um, Prisoners when it initially came out, because I guess the um, the killer per se. Um, Inception, Best Visual Effects, makes sense. It, it was Tom Hooper when Best Director for The King's Speech. Now that I do disagree with. And I'm not jumping that. I, I think... Looking at this now, and not just the discussion we've had, I, I think this should have... Hey, and here's my question. If Facebook had been around for 20 years in 2010, not six, I, I think social network sweeps. I know I know it's, I know know it's Oscars is football, right? It's all ifs and buts, ifs and buts. But genuinely, part of me wonders, was the social network, was Facebook so new? They not didn't want to acknowledge it. Did they not so see... No. How you because can watch I, I think that film and King's Speech and think the King's Speech is a better film, and it's not. That's no nothing bad on on the King's Speech. I'm actually looking up at my Blu-ray collection right now, and I have the King's Speech on Blu-ray. I'm a I'm a fan of the film. Colin Firth and Hillary Carr, fantastic. Hooper, brilliant director, but over the Social Network, yeah. over Black Swan, like Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan is a perfect film as well. Damn, what a year. 
and this is it. And I think that might be the second or third year they did ten films, ten the, the five to ten nomination rule, which was always dumb. Oh, yeah. It could be five, it could be ten. We'll pick ten, absolutely. And I like that as a thing moving forward permanently. But um, yeah, as, I, I'm not a fan this. of the top. I'm not a fan of the the top ten. I, I'm not a fan. I'm, I think it's just you're trying to make people happy with, and it also five. It's always been five keepers. It is. If the nominees, the whole voting process for me is is weird as well. Um, I don't want to get too much uh, into, into no. I mean, it's the it's the it's the, av- it's the average, isn't it? That it's the yes. put a film first a hundred times, put it fifth a hundred times, it will round out two point five. Film that comes second, no one ever put it first, will win best film. Uh, that's how a lot of safe films tend to win it with the new system, uh, which I think made everyone on a, just a really quick retrospect this year. I mean, everyone everywhere all at once actually even more remarkable. People there. should not be voting for their top five. They should be voting what they think is the best. best the film. other four should not come into co- not come into play at all. I shouldn't have to rank the five films. Just tell me what you think the best is. Yeah. And it just I, I don't understand politics, why I don't understand like why politics, we're worried. Politics, but... You should be voting for the best. And if 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 they both draw, then they split the Oscar. That's what it is. I don't understand my why. We... My issue has always been, it's like, I call it industry politics, where it's, I'm not going to shit on Scorsese. It jumps out like, Scorsese finally won Best Rights for The Departed. That makes me sound like The Departed is bad. So it's a horrendous example. But that was his career Oscar, right? Which he's, again, if and what's, Nolan is probably on paper going to win next year, which is great for me as a Nolan fan. But I'll be saying should have been 2017. I know you'll disagree because I know you love The Shape of Water. But there's for so many Oscar winners, you can look at their career and say should have actually been this other one here. Uh, and that's my issue with the Oscars. It's oh, if we're these. talking Dunkirk, though, I would. I, there's, like, yeah, yeah, like that's mine. Said, I would not. Best director I, should have been Dunkirk. Dunkirk is also one of my favorite films. Like The Shape of Water is in my top 10. But Dunkirk is. I don't want to give it away because I'm going to be releasing a video shortly with my top 100 films on. But Dunkirk is is most certainly up there, I'm and big... it's one of those ones where I would understand either way. Like, it doesn't really. Yeah. I don't really get too bothered about Oscars, but like knowing that the King's Speech won Best Film over the Social Network and Black Swan is slightly and the Fire is wild. And I think as well in in the thirteen years that have followed this film, I'm not as said as enhanced, but the concept and not popularity of social media, but the where social media is in our society now is a lot more radical yeah. than 13 years ago. Like if this film came I also out tomorrow, wonder. Sorry. Yeah, go on, mate. Sorry, come. I'd say if, if it came out today, you'd be like, this is phenomenal. This does explain all of this. Yeah. But that's because we've had social media for so long. To do this film, yeah. there's such a radical turnaround of, of when Facebook launched to the script to the book. It's not sat in production hell for 10 years. It was like we're all going at this. We want this out now. That adds yeah. to its charm. Whereas something like the King's Speech, I would probably say this isn't the King's Speech's fault. That if that was today, the same director, they'd be like from the director of Cats. We can't have him being nominated anywhere. Oh, the crowns are serious now. That's our royal family, you know, hype moment for a couple of years. So Oscars is all the industry politics. But it, it's I, I just enjoy it still. But yes, I'm with you. It's so frustrating at the same time. Sorry to die jump to jump away. No, the Oscars. Yeah, I, again, I I feel like we put too much um, respect on them. I understand as a as a an ex actor, a retired actor, that the Oscars was definitely something that all actors look towards when starting an acting career. But there, I was not aware of all the politics and everything that came into play when it comes to Oscars. Um, the Andrea Riseborough stuff last year was insane. I think yeah. she's brilliant into Leslie. I think she's one of the one of the better performances of the year. But that whole debacle really showed the way uh, the whole voting situation is messed up. And also my biggest problem, again, we're going on a tangent, but my biggest problem with the Oscars is the fact that all these vote, the voting happens after everyone has already seen who won all the other awards, all the other award ceremonies. So it's like, oh, they won everything everywhere. I'm just going to vote for them. Um, I do feel like the whole process is done really weirdly, and I'm not a fan. No, I, I, I'm with you. Um, it, yeah, it's it's 
there's a lot of stuff with that, isn't there? And that would be we are heading to Oscar season, I guess, had it with this series with with what's going to follow after with the festivals and that stuff. We're pretty tame compared to other channels. There's nothing wrong with people. I was, it's when a film comes out, it's like, what, what's your thoughts? My thoughts are nothing but these Oscar wins here. That's what I can't cope with. Well, people and I get, are putting out tweets about who they think is going to win the Oscar. And I'm like, mm. well, first and foremost, you haven't seen 50% of the films that are still left to come out this year. And secondly, no, just no. I When Oppenheimer came out, I mean, I'll hold my hands up. I think it'll be on record somewhere. I said, I think this will be Nolan's year. But that, and I was very conscious of saying as yeah, well. I agree it's with that, July. Though, George. But, and but I said, I said at the time, it's July. But yeah, yeah the... but you can do it on one film. One film is okay to say, okay, I feel like this film is something which just is so much better than everything else. And you can do that because you've watched films from previous years, right? So you can do it once. I've done it with Oppenheimer. I came out of there and I was like, this is going to win this, 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 and this. And I can't see, it's going to be. Obviously, with Dune Part Two expected to come out well, this year was, as well. That was my mind. My mind was always exactly. If Dune gets delayed. I think Oppenheimer wins, and it boom. And, it, and, and you know what? It's, it's what I said before, right? Because the Oscar battle then becomes: we haven't given Danny an Oscar yet, and we haven't given Nolan an Oscar. So who's going to get their career one? Now, again, I've not seen them. We're going to have, I think, on paper, straight shoot up between Nolan and Scorsese, which is. Hopefully, I, I hopefully fucking love flowers for me. But yeah, the coming months will have all of that. So don't worry, people. We are going to change our coverage this year as well. So we'll have more details down the line. But let's talk about box office because a film about Facebook had a budget of 45 million, which is ridiculous compared to how terrible films are these days um, that are sort of 10 times as much. But gross $225 million. I didn't think a film about Facebook would. Um, but people turned up, people enjoyed it. It's gone down as one of the, I think the the Writers Guild of America put it as one of the the third best screenplay of the century, in terms of respect and this film's legacy in the years that have followed it. This has only gone up in people's estimations. This is a film I see spoken about online all the time, when people are talking about Fincher's best film and people are talking about biopics, when people talk about films and performances. The social network is always in the discussion. Now, you're a bit like me, and arrogantly put we're very aware of the bubble that is film Twitter. And I do think without sounding horrifically opinionated, you're wearing a football top. Everyone knows I'm into football as well. We see a lot of comparisons with football and football Twitter. And so and like film Twitter at times, but the one thing I've always felt like film Twitter exists within its own bubble, whereas football Twitter is a lot more average Joe public involvement. And that's really weird side tangent to go down. But I don't even have gone to this point, but I don't see not normal people talking about the social network. I can't see the social network as a film. I'd pop up to like a group of mates and go, do you want to watch social network? I'd say like, hey, have you seen it? It's fucking sick. Give it a watch if you haven't seen it. I couldn't sit there and have the kind of chat I could about other films, right? So it's really interesting because I do think a lot of people that would have seen this would like it, but I also do think it's, I'm not saying a harder sell because I'm not talking about box office, but would people be interested in a Facebook film in the year 2023 that haven't already seen it? I'm not trying to, that sounds like a negative. I don't mean it. Do you see where I'm trying to sort of come from that? I know where you're going with it. I can so well respected. I and it is an know, unbelievable film. I know what you mean about the, the Twitter bubble, right? And there's a lot of films that people just would never see. Like my mates that I've known for my whole life that I hang around with on a daily basis, probably wouldn't give a crap about most of the films that I watch. But I do feel like the social network is one that they've spoken about and really like. Um, and again, Finch is kind of one of them directors that kind of meshes between the two, the film and Twitter world and the um, the public world, to be honest. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Darren. I do think with Fincher, even that sort of comment, actually, talking about the general public, I don't think he's, I'm not saying he's not a director of the public, no. The concept of a director as a brand is very rare in film these days, right? I genuinely, right now, fundamentally believe Chris Nolan and Tarantino are the two main directors. And this isn't a slight on Spielberg, his quality. You're going to pick two directors. You put the name on a poster. You don't put what films have done. Or you're just going to turn up for those two. Someone can easily jump out and say, this, 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 fine. Other films, other directors, you have to now put their films on with them, right? Um it's not a discredit to their careers or ability, but it's who the who are the audience that are going to go to the cinema because 
To me, the biggest in the threat facing industry is people not going to the cinema now. They're picking and choosing. Thanks to Netflix. Thanks to short turnarounds to video on demand. David Fincher, I don't know how big a household name he is, but I can tell you this. His films are all household films. People know Seven. They know Fight Club. Yeah, they, that's it, Benjamin right? Button is very... I believe that's his highest grossing film. Benjamin Button is the new Gone Girl as well. It's really interesting that the audience template has gone away from directors. Even Spielberg, right? I'm not saying the famous bombed because Spielberg did not that at all. It only got made because of him, but even Spielberg might not bring in the crowd he did in the same, back in the day of having his name on films. That's just audiences politely put for me, being absolutely zapped into certain franchises as the only way only way to enjoy cinemas. Spielberg's and we're... different though, because he's made I know it's 30, a really bad 30 comparison. Fil- he's made like 30 films, hasn't he? Across and, 50 all, years. All, and not all his yeah. films have been blockbuster hits, right? He exactly. is the blockbuster king because of obviously the, the type of films that he is associated with. But it's not like he's got like Tarantino's got nine films and every single one of those films is very much in the same vein. They're very violent. They're very um they all have his, his stamp on them from Reservoir Dogs all the way up to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. They all feel like Tarantino films. Whereas Spielberg yeah. It's the, they don't it's, all it's, feel like Spielberg films, you know what I mean? Yeah, the way I'd say with Spielberg, and I think it's where some people are very unfair on him, is if he was doing a blockbuster today, a outright blockbuster, it will make money. The marketing will work. It's going to work. Example is actually Ready Player One because it broke gross like 800 million plus in 2018, which literally sums that point up that people say, oh, he's not done anything. He's done dramas. He's done smaller films. Obviously, there's been COVID. But if Spielberg wanted to do a blockbuster that could get audiences in, they will turn up. Um, but yeah, that's the team whether he wants to do them. So that was a poor comparison, my end. Apologies, I've lost half a segment onto this. But um, with Fincher, sorry, that's it. Again, I don't think he's the biggest household name, but everyone knows his films. And I just think we're in this stage of social network where a lot of people want to watch this film. It made a lot of money at the box office. Of course, it sort of quadrupled its returns and passed that. But I don't know if he's a household name. I don't know how I've waffled onto this. I feel really bad. But um, I guess that's where I'm going, the perception of this film and I guess his work leading into the killer. Yeah, sorry, I'm really off point. Uh, I'm trying to segue back. Um, let's just skip this. Let's talk favourite scenes. Do you have one we've not spoke about? Favourite scene? Uh, there's no, so I many great... I, I, there's I not, don't a, have there's a, not a single I, bad scene. There's not a single average scene. Every scene's fucking excellent. I don't um, have a favourite scene. Scene. No, no, probably the making of the um, the the app, the, the dating app, the uh, the hot or not type thing. Just the pacing of that scene, the characters going Shark Week. Like it's just, it's just, it's just so good. Everything about it is is so on point. Um, but the opening scene is hard to not say that. The scene yeah. in the nightclub with. Um, the two of them and, and the two models when they're talking about Victoria's secret models and there's just no care in the world about them. It's just um the uh the oh, Jesus Christ. The Bill Gates scene was just hilarious. I found that <laughs> pretty wild. Yeah, it's very hard to, to pick a, a favorite scene, to be honest. No, I'm kind of with you. I think one scene I want to talk about is the I'm not talking about I spoke about it, but if I was pinpointing a singular scene, it's a bit cheap to say the opening scene, but I got to go the opening because I think it sets up the entire film in the best possible way an opening scene can. And the fact it sort of comes full circle come the end, where is the film ends of him just constantly refreshing a page, waiting for her validation. Um, but yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. It's tricky talking about this. I know we've gone almost two hours. Uh, this is one of the longest entries. It's just two of us as well. I want to get your final thoughts. I know it's going to be hard to summarize this down. We spoke about it so well for a while. We've had some pretty engaging topics on biopics, directors, actors as well. So it's been a pretty amazing review. But final thoughts for me. Is this David Fincher's best film? I think so, yes. Right now, at the time of going through these eight again. Do I prefer it to seven? Probably not in the sense of like what I enjoy the most. 
But how do you compare Seven to Search Network aside from the fact it's the same director? There's no no other way to do so. So I well, am. I, I'm actually. Way. I really want to watch this film again. That's what I'm sort of ending on. Very quickly, I really want to watch it again. Yeah, we'll put it this way: it is my ninth favorite film of all time. And let's just check if we've got any other Finchers in the, in the top one hundred. I'm curious because his again his work differs so much. Like Nolan's, you can see more of, you can see more recurring themes and more recurring ideas and character types and production. Whereas Finch's is yeah. almost like he, he's a perfectionist. He's going to do this until only, it's fucking right. It's the only one in my top hundred. Interesting. I hope you're not like shit. I need to change something. Um, no, but I've yeah, had this. I've had this ready for a minute and it's kind of like, you know, you just keep going back and looking at it and it's you're like... hundred films as well. That's a lot. Like, it doesn't just, matter what you do, there's going to be amazing ones missing. Yeah, and it's always one of those ones. Anytime you do one of those, it's like, oh, you you can't pick this. Like the other day I put up on Twitter, it was my favourite film from every year. And someone was like, what about this? What about that? And I'm like, yeah, but like, there's more than one good film comes out a year. Like, I'm sorry that I prefer one to the other. It's like when I do a Tarantino ranking, it's like, oh, why is this number? Why is this the, the worst? I'm like, it's not the worst. It's I love them all. It's just, you know what I mean? I've, yeah. One of them I've got to prefer to the other. No, I, I'm with you on that. Um, but I think that's going to round out our review. Uh, I know we are recording pretty late. It's the Evil London Film Festival. Europe, incredibly early to watch Saltburn. Tate's going to be watching Saltburn as well. We're talking in the future tense that Salt Burnery will be out on the channel, as will many others. Um, but aside from that, Reese, it's been amazing getting you on. We're going to be back next week with our review of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And looking at the schedule, we've also got Gone Girl, we've got Mank, and The Killer is making the list. Uh, oh, that poster, poster finally out. Love the poster. Um, now, again, we're talking in the past from the future. Maybe we're lucky and we get onto the killer red carpet. I, I doubt we will. That's my initial thoughts a couple of days before that happening. And we get interviews. If we do, great. That will be up on the channel and I'll be trying not to pass out on the interviews. Um, but we have said that we don't want to do a review for the killer, but we want to do something for it at the festival. So by the time this video comes out, we aren't sure what's going to be up there. But our in-depth main review for the killer is going to be Monday, November the 13th to round out the series. And it follows the Netflix release date, so everyone's had the first couple of days to be able to watch it, if not at the cinema. So um, we know how, obviously, lucky we are. It's basically what we're talking about film bubbles, isn't it? Sometimes festival goers are so so out of the zone, they don't realise that the general public won't see these films for four months and might not see them at all. And they're just short talking like everyone's seen it with them on social media. Um, and that I've been I've been at fault with that in the past on press screenings, to be fair. But, you know, it does happen. Um, but Reese, you've always got a lot going on. Um, I know you've been covering the festival. I know you've mentioned your top 100 list. What else have you got going on where people can subscribe? I know we have you on so much they should know by now. But yeah, so the best thing to do is is on Twitter Rio's positive P O V. Uh, Rio's is R E O S. Uh, there you can find the links to the two podcasts that I do. The Cinematic podcast is on a hiatus for uh, a month or two. Uh, just why I'm busy with other stuff. We'll be back in November with more episodes, interviewing people within the film industry, uh, finding out what makes them tick. The weekly podcast I do with Manuel, r and a conversation on cinema, is out every single Tuesday. Uh, the YouTube channel, I'll be bringing out some new content on their content. I hate saying that, but it I is know. on YouTube. I feel like it is on YouTube. YouTube, you can justify it. If it's a yeah, video, you can justify YouTube it. YouTube video, I'll be bringing out some some videos soon. Um, and then my writing will be on the cinematique.com. There'll be uh, quite a few reviews from myself over London Film Festival. And then also there will be a few reviews on that site from uh, Chris O'Connor, uh, Matty Dudin, uh, a few other people who are going to be writing for the site over the um, the festival. So many reviews will be up there. There's a review for Hitman from Chris O'Connor on there now. Um, there'll be a, a review of Corey Ada's Monster. There'll be a review of memory to jessica chastain and peter skarsgård film and every other film which is at the festival so looking forward to focusing on the festival for a couple of weeks everything else in my life is taking a back seat for two weeks and it's just purely um 
London Film Festival, uh, enjoying the festival, enjoying the films, enjoying the, the people, the company, obviously, um, seeing people that I know, obviously people like yourself who I see all the time, some people who I see very rarely, and some people who I haven't even met yet. So um, London Film Festival is always one of my highlights of the year, and I'm really looking forward to Saltburn in the morning. Definitely. And I can't wait to see you there. There'll be group photos. There's a football Super Sunday, uh, which I'm dreading um, based off something tonight. Um, but yes, it's been amazing. Everybody, please follow Reese. Get him on there. And everybody with us, you can get us on linktree.com slash cinema savvy. It's got a link to our socials. We'll be updating them. Would have updated them over the festival with where you can find us, what we're up to. I mentioned next week, Dragon Tattoo. There's a lot of other videos happening. Ahsoka's finished. Um, yeah. It's weird plugging the future because all of our sort of shows are finishing. But as I said, the Finch retrospective continues every Monday alongside some new release reviews. So thank you all for watching. Take care and we'll join you on the next one.